First of all, I'm struck that you're both psychologists and, and you're both very early on your path um, um, melded your psychological experience and knowledge and entered the spiritual path. Um, and you've also both been very open about traumas that you've experienced in your life. So I'm just wondering if you could, uh, each of you, tell me the connections that you see between Western psychology trauma and 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 the spiritual path that you've both been pioneering and pursuing all these years to our dear who should go first um, I, I, well, I, no I don't so whoever has moved whoever's moved to speak <laughs> so Gabor actually um, my experience was um, backwards from what you described. Okay. Uh, I went, I had a lot of family trauma. And right. in particular, I had a father who was in many ways mentally ill and um, violent, violent and abusive uh, and very, very unpredictable. He was a brilliant scientist, but at home he was a tyrant and he would beat my mother and um, it was an atmosphere of a lot of fear when he was around um, for years and years. My mom used to hide bottles behind the curtains so she could pick one up to defend herself in certain rooms um, just so she would be a little bit safer, not get thrown onto the floor or down the stairs or something. So that was, uh, that was tough. <clears throat> and then I heard when I was in the university um, studying pre-med to go to medical school right. or and a chemistry and all that, I heard Buddhist teachings that there was suffering and that there was also a cause and, and that there was a path to the end of it. And I got really interested and studied it. And then I decided to go to a Buddhist country. And uh, ended up, I also spent time in Haight-Ashbury taking LSD and little punch wagon at the Fillmore Theater for music and things. I asked to go to a Buddhist country. I went in the Peace Corps, worked on these village um, rural health medical teams, and then went into a Buddhist monastery and learned all kinds of things, which we can talk about including practices of compassion and forgiveness and mindfulness of the body and many things that now make up good trauma work. And then I came back and I tried to figure out what happened to me after five years there. Uh, and I went to graduate school in counseling and psychology and then got a PhD in clinical psychology and began to realize that, uh, there was something valuable in the Western psychological approach, which I found to be a kind of paired attention, a kind of the same attention that one might learn in mindful, loving awareness in oneself, that we pay attention to one another. Um, and then to cut it very short after that, um, what became clear, now it's been 45 years of teaching, as the years unfolded, is that there was a tremendous amount of trauma in the people who came to meditate. Half of them, that's what brought them there, like me. Um, and that we really needed to incorporate a wisdom of that, because a lot of people approach spirituality hoping to transcend a kind of spiritual bypass. Um, but in fact, you can't meditate, well, some of them can, but you can't meditate and heal the trauma unless you face it in some way. And so we began to incorporate the things that we'd learned from our Western trauma training and Western psychology. There wasn't even trauma in, mentioned in Western psychological training when I did my PhD back in the 70s, it's psychiatry and psychology. They didn't use that word very much. It's, it's kind of remarkable, if not nutty, a kind of deep denial since half of what walks in the door is trauma. Um, there were, um, and so we developed ways, and now in our community, most of the people who've trained as teachers, also they're required to do uh, 
some deep training, such as Peter Levine's somatic experience or things like that, in concert with their training to be a meditation teacher. Um, and it makes an enormous difference. Well, thank um, you. And uh, yes, I remember uh, I did get your history uh, backwards because um, I've, I've known about that history before. Um, something you said about that reminded me of what James Baldwin once said, something like, uh, you can't fix everything that you face, but you can't fix anything that you don't face. So that in order to deal with something, you have to face it. Tara, you've talked about your eating disorder, um, which um, for me is in every single case a trauma response. It's not one of these mysterious diseases. It's very much a, one of the outcomes of trauma. Um, what can you say about your path with trauma and psychology and then spiritual work? Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for asking and bringing that in because my mom was an active alcoholic for most of my time growing up in, in the household. And I ended up with an eating disorder that became really evident in my teens. I gained a lot of weight and I was just riddled with with shame and, you know, also a perfectionist trying to achieve, achieve, improve myself and always feeling like I was falling short, something I, I came to term as the, the trance of unworthiness. And, um, and I had siblings, fetal alcohol syndrome with really, you know, just I could, it became clear over time the effect of, of that. So when I was in, uh, right towards the end of college, I began doing yoga and I started getting in my body and more in touch and more awake and decided to join an ashram, a, a spiritual community, partly because of the suffering of feeling like I was flawed. And as you said, Gabor, I have now, in, in working with myself and so many of us have trauma, uh, the shame and the addictive behavior, th it all gets paired together. That, it, you know, I can see now a sense of this intelligence and in trying to nourish myself and meet unmet needs, you know, through food and also through drugs um, when I was in college. And, and how then those behaviors made me ashamed of myself even more. And, and I read a very powerful little anonymous story some years back. It's called A Fairy Story. Uh, and and I, I read it because it was handed to me by one of my clients. And she described her own coming out of trauma in... And we, we work together a lot with, with the different kind of uh, practices Jack has referred to. But she described that it was like she was in this closet, uh, shaking out a fear of another attack from her alcoholic father. And she prayed and called on for help. And this, this good fairy appeared and, you know, said, I, I can't really help you get rid of all the pain but what I can do is send it to different parts of your body and kind of tamper it down so you won't feel it so much and she went ahead and did that and she and she said and the little girl said but you know are you going to leave me and she said I'll leave a voice in you and that voice will be a calling back to wholeness and even though you'll be you know you'll you won't feel the pain as much and you'll act in ways that you know are functional but don't maybe look so good that voice will call you back to wholeness and when you're ready when you have the resources you'll start unpacking and untwisting and undoing that pain and reconnect with your wholeness and your wholeness has never been taken away your soul's always there it's just been covered over and I'm sharing that with you Gabor because that was kind of how it was. I had this calling towards something spiritual, something whole. And what I came to sense, like there's this severed belonging. I was severed from my body and I was, you know, severed from feeling real intimacy with others. And there was this calling for some larger belonging. And so that, that brought me to the ashram and the practices there. 
it was interesting. They um, they helped me feel a more direct sense of the sacred and how it lived through me. They didn't help me face the actual pain or suffering in my body and heart. It wasn't until I um, left the ashram and I went to my first Buddhist retreat, and that was, oh gosh, in my early 30s, that I got introduced to mindfulness and I actually started learning how to re-inhabit my body in a full way. I mean, the yoga got me high, but it didn't really teach me how to pay attention to the parts of me that I was running away from. And so it was through Buddhist meditation, uh, as Jack describes, it's, you know, that's where I was able to begin to integrate and uh, feel more of the wholeness that originally drew me to the spiritual path. And during um, that transition, I was finishing up my doctorate in psychology, and it was becoming more and more clear that meditation alone wasn't going to do it. It required some of the Western strategies of bringing uh, contents into consciousness, but we need meditation, it's really empowering because then we can start to resource ourselves and we can talk more about the diff- particulars that meditation offers, but that's what allows us to actually feel that sense of belonging to really something beyond this finite body that really helps us to do all the healing. Well, thank you. Uh, so let's come back to the Buddhist um teachings for a moment. Um, uh, Jack, I heard you speak many times and read um, some couple of your books. And, you know, you're very clear on the Buddhist sources of uh, suffering, uh, greed and anger and ignorance and so on. Um, th- those cause a lot of suffering, but they're also the results of suffering, aren't they? So they all lead to trauma, but they also are rooted in trauma. And I read a very interesting book. I'm sure you know Mark Epstein, a Buddhist psychiatrist. And in his, in his book, uh, The Trauma of Everyday Life, he makes this point that I thought, how come I didn't think of this? Because he points out that the Buddha actually was a traumatized child. His mother died when he was a week old. And although in the Buddhist mythology or, or cosmology that's presented in sort of magical heaven ascending terms, in fact, the Buddha didn't have to wait to see a dead body or an old person or a sick person to be acquainted with suffering. It was rooted in his own very first uh, piece of life. So um, these Buddhist sources of suffering, do you see them as related to trauma? Yeah, and I, I kind of want to connect it back to the film since uh, this is in some way ancillary or, or maybe adding to the beauty of, of the film that you made or, or were a part of. Um, and part I, of what... I was, I was the victim of it, let me put it up. Yes, well, you're the victim of life, Gabor. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry... But the, the Buddha said, that's what happens. You get born, you have a human incarnation. And, and yeah. with the human incarnation, there will be suffering. And that's just an important thing to acknowledge. Um, and it's part of the gift of your film is that you let people who watch and the people you work with realize that it's not their fault, that the struggles that they have often and the suffering they have are due to, in Buddhist teachings, what are called prior causes and conditioning, just as you're describing, whether it's the Buddhist mother's death or, or all kinds of other prior suffering. And what's beautiful about the film, among many things, is the compassion that you that you offer when you let people know that their suffering is not their fault. And so it lifts that shame and blame and so forth. And it comes in part from not only your own suffering, which I might ask about, but your willingness to go to the places of great suffering, literally in Vancouver to go and work with the uh, 
people who are homeless or addicted and so forth. And I think of our mutual dear friend Sharon Salzberg, who was up in the northwest in Seattle. She'd actually gone out to a restaurant and she'd come out and there were people on the streets like by Pike's Market. And a homeless man came up to her, kind of ragged, and looked at her and said, don't you know me? And Sharon said she had to stop for a moment and think, was this someone among the thousands of students who'd been on retreats or classes with her? She really looked her fact and couldn't remember, and probably it wasn't. But then the question resonated deeper, and she realized, don't you know me? Don't you know who I am, a human being who needs to be seen in their secret beauty? And you've done that. Um, in the film, in some way, you've humanized um, and, and lifted that, that suffering. Then there's another step, uh, which feels really important and was coming in the conversation that Tara and you were talking about. And that is that that kind of witnessing that very often trauma, because it happened in relationship to another person, can't be healed completely solo on your own. It actually has to be healed in relationship. Um, and it has these different dimensions. So I'll tell a tiny or a little bit of a scene. I worked, have worked for years with Michael Mead, Luis Rodriguez, Maladoma Somme, Robert Blight, doing men's retreats and doing a lot at times with young men, kids and teens coming out of street gangs um, and vets coming back. And we had a series of retreats for veterans um, that were based on, of course, understanding trauma. And the way trauma works, and you articulate it, it's held in the body with certain emotions. Um, so there's a physical dimension in the work of Peter Levine and Bessel van der Kolk talk about how you can release that from the body. It's there in the emotional body, all the unfelt feelings and so forth. <clears throat> and it's there with a story that goes on in the mind. And so working with these vets, they were encouraged through ritual and practices to move their body and let, let out what they were carrying in that way. Um, in many cases, they also had, we did practices that allowed for their feelings to come forth and be witnessed um, quite profoundly. Uh, and that was done in, in, in ritual ways. Um, we would, with gang kids too, we'd light a candle on the table and say, put a, go out in the parking lot and grab a stone and put a stone there for every person you know Every young person you know who was shot, if they're a gang kid who died with their name, Tito and RJ, and, or if you're a vet, your comrades who were killed. And that candle, that simple ritual with the name spoken out loud said, we now have a place to go to the suffering that we've carried for so long. And then they were encouraged to tell and write their story. And at the end, we brought back in their families because they couldn't tell their families. And this is the worst of it. They couldn't tell what they saw. They couldn't. It was just too painful and horrific and gory. They didn't want to lay that on their family. But it was even worse than that. They said, it's not that I can't just tell what I saw. I can't say what I did. What I had to do. And with this work, they finally were able to stand up <clears throat> and read a passage of what they'd written that they were never able to give a voice to and be held in community. So now it's body and emotions and story. And when the story was done, they were welcomed back into the community as a whole being. Um, there was a ritual to welcome them home. And I'm taking the time to tell this and because it kind of unpacks what good trauma work is that has to include these dimensions. And in a way, at the end of the film, um, if you will, people are left with, okay, I now get the depth of this trauma and the tears. Um, how do I do this? How do I heal? And then there are these beautiful traditions like 
EMDR from Bessel's work describing or Peter Levine's somatic experience that you can go online and find and find a good trauma therapist. Thank you, Jack. Um, what you're emphasizing here is so important uh, that the, what, the, what the Buddhists talk about, the, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, the Sangha being the community. And, and what you're emphasizing here is the, the importance of being held in community to heal uh, trauma, as opposed to just the isolated monk sitting by himself on a, on, on a cushion. Not as opposed to, but in addition to. Uh, Tara, I watched your talk, uh, Hungry Ghosts on Addiction, and you may know that my book on addiction is called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. And, um, and you talked about attachment uh, or desire becoming attachment, and that then shows up as an addiction. But interestingly to me, I don't think in that whole talk you mentioned trauma. So that you, you went from the, uh, I'm not, not, this is not to debate, but I'm just curious because you describe very well the phenomena, just that what creates that desperation drive. Um, let me put it this way. You know, the Buddhist word attachment, it's, but to me, attachment, that kind of attachment arises when we don't get attachment needs met in childhood. So, the, so, so it's the lack of attachment that leads to that other attachment that then has us hooked in addictive ways. I wonder if you'd comment on that. Yeah, in a way it goes back to your question about Buddhism and suffering because, and trauma, is, 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 is suffering really trauma? And in a way I, I think of it that um, part of just incarnating means that we have a sense of a separate self and the, and the primal mood of the separate self is fear. And, it's, and in this society, for the fearful self not to get the attunement it needs to reassure of belonging is trauma. I think there's trauma in most nervous systems because of it. And the basic unmet needs, and I'm thinking of one woman I was with at at a retreat, and she didn't have, you know, some overt story of abuse, but there was this sense, of this deep sense of not belonging anywhere, of not not really trusting she was lovable. And so the process really for us was to sense, well, where, you know, where do you sense a feeling of loving? And she couldn't go to her parents. She couldn't find it anywhere. And she was grasping and she would, in her relationship, she would, um, she would be the one to be like really clinging and needy and then feel like it wasn't working. She said, when she imagined the love of Jesus, she, she felt held and she was wearing a shawl and, and she said, you know, if I could just feel this shawl as Jesus. And that's what happened, Gabor, is that she felt that, that, that love kind of permeating the shawl and, and she was doing a lot of walking meditation because again, with undoing trauma, movement is so helpful. And that was what began to soften around that basic unmeet unmet need of not having the caregivers in the way and we followed up and and there's a there's a phrase that she loved and I love too which is love is always loving you and that's what trauma blocks us from knowing and that's what most of us don't know because we didn't have that that mirroring that let us know that we belonged and for another man who, you know, huge PTSD, very big triggering of fear, it was know that you're being held in the heart of the Buddha. And for another woman, it was when she was diagnosed and totally terrified with a fl uh, life-threatening disease and didn't have that sense of belonging. It was for her, she would say, please love me and feel something, some loving presence of the universe holding her. Sometimes for some people that softens things up enough. Like if we can, I know for myself, I call out to a sense of the beloved and feel that compassion that's so universal coming through. And that's when I can begin to hold myself with more compassion and then actually let in others. So there are different pathways. 
I think ultimately, if we don't heal in relationship, um, it's not it's not integrated. But I found for so many that meditation helps them tap something universal that's there but hidden, and wake that up. Mm-hmm.